Well, good morning. Um, battery's low. Okay. Well, we won't be recording the service today. We'll have to just deal with the video. All right. Um, I do want to address something really quick right behind me. Uh, a little bit of blood drive here, which I think is fantastic. I think there's plenty of people that need it. Um, of course, this church doesn't condone the uh, cashing in on the devil's night, just so that everybody knows. Um, I've already done a sermon on uh, that particular holiday. There's no Jesus Christ in it, then we have no business being involved in it. I think that's all I need to address on that situation. So we'd all bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for knowing your love. You changed the direction of our lives with your Holy Spirit and paths that are necessary for your glory. All these things in our lives occur. To your holy name we praise. Lord, we always ask for your help and your providence. Lord, we ask for your strength and your comfort. We are in trying times. We need to stand strong and be the light in this world. Lord, we thank you for a great many things, even the freedom to, to join together to worship you. Lord, I ask that your words be clear today. I am just a man trying to share your gospel. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Last week I uh, inadvertently missed Gad. So I offer my apologies for that. Now, we're going to find Gad. Gad, really quick, uh, is the fortune of God. He was the seventh son of Jacob. Gad was also David's seer prophet in 1 Chronicles 21.9. 21 or 29 29 second chronicles 29 25 if you want me to repeat those again gad was david seer prophet first chronicles 21 9 21 29 29 and second chronicles 29 25 he rebuked david uh, and gave him his choice of punishments when in uh, when in spite of the advice of jo joab uh, and the traditional objections he had counted children of Israel and to instruct David to erect an altar on threshing floor of Aruna when the plague that had descended on Israel eased. This actually came from the uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Um, now, today's message, before I get into it, I do want to uh, address things as the servant leader of this fellowship. It's just a matter of days will be not only a historical event, uh, but no doubt a significant biblical event as it will play out a role in God's plan. There's a lot of discussion of decisions. And Franklin Graham has been pushing this for some time. Um, and of course, I was undecided for a long time whether or not I would even get involved. Uh, a few things happened. First, the quote, freedom is not having the right to do what you want, but having the right to do what you ought. A fellow named Jim Caviezel had said that. He is the uh, uh, fellow who was the actor in the movie Passion of Christ. Um, we have to be ambassadors for Christ. And I want you to make sure you understand that. That's not to say that you jump on a bandwagon of any kind, but you have to be an ambassador for Christ. Always be aware of what the right thing is to do in life. Sometimes it's hard. You have to seek proper counsel. Determinism is something I was uh, fighting with myself. 
okay? Uh, determinism is dangerous. Determinism is a, not a, a, da is a dangerous place for any Christian to put themselves in. We know that we have a sovereign God and that all things will play out according to God's will. This does not mean we sit and wait. Uh, wherefore, my beloved, as we have always obeyed, not as in presence only, but now much more in the absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's Philippians 2.12. We need to obey all the commandments and ordinances. We should be in prayer and study on all matters to make those righteous decisions we have and an abundance of freedom to do. Freedom is a curse upon the Christians of this world. That's John Piper. Some have found, uh, made clear a, a decision to use the pulpit for politics. I will stand firm that that is a complete and total abuse of the commission. I'm going to repeat that. I will stand firm that that is a complete and total abuse of the commission. I won't spend a second of God's time talking about those abominable things. My job is to win souls for Christ, to teach people the ultimate, unwavering, unmoving, unshakable love of Jesus Christ. Amazing grace that is given to us. It would be a blessing for us to spend a minute in hell, except our Lord omits it all together. You have to do the right thing if the Holy Spirit compels you. Again, my job is to attempt to express the words on these pages of this book in a pure and genuine exegetical fashion so we can all develop a deep, strong relationship with Christ our Lord. Revelation 8, verse 1. And I can't tell you how exciting Revelation or Apocalypse has been. Uh, the more I get into it, the more, or to be less, white is on the page. I love this Bible. It gives me room to great, put great notes in here. It's been an absolute blessing. First one, and when we had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. Now I want to first say again that it's a comfort in knowing this is a wrath upon those who do not believe that's going to be unfolding in these books. Not upon the church, although there's a common conclusion that the church is already in heaven. Most commentaries say the silence in the church, silence in this particular passage is the church being silent. And I can't agree with that. Uh, we should have come to the conclusion that Christ says, what Christ says is the truth, and if he says that he will come at the last trumpet, we should endure until the end, then it must be true. Some come to the pulpit and spend a lot of time telling us what they think. Wretched sinners expound on their thoughts and ideas on what the Bible is trying to say, and it should just be interpreted scripture. And again, I'm paraphrasing John Piper. When it comes to a great many things in prophecy, it is hard to give a real genuine answer for some of these things. It is sometimes safer just to say, I don't know. The subject of the half hour of silence has many uh, concepts. One theologian who believed the church uh, has already left, uh, had made a colorful, uh, or an off color, sex, uh, sexist comment that perhaps the women hadn't descended yet. Uh, that's a clear example of the theologian should have remained silent himself. Um, looking into an idea that uh, is uh, the completion of the judgment theory. Uh, but it seems that the seventh seal opens the commission of the seven angels with seven trumpets. Another idea is that it's a reference to a figurative day, prophetic week, time, even a literal week. Um, and these ideas all have good scriptural reference. Again, with the exception of women not being in heaven, which is moronic. Um, for me, at this time, again, it's safe to conclude, I don't know. Uh, when it says there was a half hour of silence, I don't have an answer. Verse 2, And I saw the seven angels that stood before God, and to them given seven trumpets. The seven will be doing the work of the vials and all the bowls as well. Uh, these seven, I guess, you could say, are the righteous hands 
the Lamb's wrath poured out onto the world. They were given an action of proclaim the ability to achieve the works and the wrath. And again, you're going to see that word given several times because every angel, every demon that you're going to see in the next couple of chapters couldn't do these things on their own. They had to be allowed. Verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given to him much incense that should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The word another in Greek, uh, there's two actually. Alos, which means is, is an adjective for a different one, and heteros, which is another of the same kind. In this passage, it is heteros. Uh, the reason for the distinction is some of the theologians I've come across, it, you, you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but I'm going to tell you what they said. They claim it's a particular angel. Uh, it should be, it, it's what? They claim it's not a particular angel, but they somehow make the idea that it was Jesus. Um, and I have to remind you that some of the uh, folks under the umbrella of Christianity believe that Christ was an angel. However, theologically flawed and heretical that statement is, uh, they have condoned a great many. Where's page 63? To believe this, uh, which is about 8 million people, uh, which is trumped by another pseudo Christian theology that believes that Jesus Christ was an alien, and God the Father actually copulated uh, to create Christ, uh, there's about 15 million there. If there is any wonder how the devil could come into this world and say that he is Jesus Christ and fool even the children, remember, there are many that think Christ and Michael are one and the same. And also that God the Father had copulated to create His Son, both of which were aliens. Um, you know, and, and again, reading the Scripture and it's saying that the, even the people that are saying would be duped. It's, people believe just about anything instead of reading the Scripture. What I'm getting. Verse four, and the smoke in the incense which came with the prayers of saints ascending up to before God out of the angel's hand. The layout of the altar is similar to the throne room. Okay, here we see the altar of prayers for saints. Um, this is uh, at the initial altar. There is an initial altar for sacrifice in, in the temple. Uh, in this case, it's not, you're not going to see that in the throne room because well, Christ was our ultimate sacrifice for all of our sins. Um, the altar, there will be a, uh, an altar for showbread. Um, set at the right side with seven candles right before the entrance of the holiest place. The golden altar of incense of prayers was kept close to the throne. Because those incense were supposed to be representative of prayers. Now again, if the saints are with God in heaven, then the whole aspect of that would be pointless. That whole scripture would be pointless. Uh, in addition, it would be... The, we would be singing. And that's what we're made for. We're made to give praise and glory to God. We'd be singing hymns and praising Him. Now the other thing that you need to pay attention to uh, in uh, that verse is ascending up before God. So they're ascending up. We're still here. We're still here praying. Which is good. Uh, verse 5, the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the, the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. Who here prays, Lord, come quickly? I do. I pray constantly, Lord, come quickly. Well, here we have answered prayers in the scripture. Fire has been a very significant term used for the judgment as seen by Christ's eyes and purification in Isaiah 6. Spurgeon often refers to the sanctification of the elect as being in the furnace. But here, it seems to be very clear the beginning of judgment. These thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes seem to be minor, kind of uh, dipping one's toe in the water.
Verse 6. And the seven angels which had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. I imagine these angels like pipers. Backpipers. In a line preparing to, to pipe in the army. In this case they're trumpeting in the wrath of God. Verse 7. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And there were case upon the earth with the third part of the trees that burnt up and all the green grass was burnt. Um, I do want to make a point that I believe that some of these things are not metaphoric. I don't think they're allegorical. I think they're genuine. Excuse me, a bit thirsty today. I think that what John saw is very much like what's going to actually happen. So yes, I actually believe that blood will be coming from the sky. Um, there's a place called Taiga, if I'm pronouncing it right, I don't speak Russian. Uh, it's known as the Boreal Forest in Russia, the equivalent of one third of the Earth's trees. Ironically, that is actually one third of the Earth's trees. Taiga covers a few thousand miles of the northern portion of Russia. Fire consumes oxygen. And if it consumes a massive amount of the trees which produce oxygen, well, obviously, there's going to be a problem with the oxygen. Um, there's also going to be a tremendous amount of wildlife uh, that will there that will die. Um, that is just the first trumpet, and it alone can, can cause serious, uh, dangerous, dangerous to the existence of mankind. No doubt, there will be some that will be consumed by the massive fire as well. Verse eight. And then the second angel sounded, and it was a great mountain burnt with fire, was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Verse 9, the third part of the creatures that were in the sea had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. This, they believe, is a massive asteroid falling to the earth. A third of the sea is approximately a fourth of the earth, since three-fourths of the earth is water. Millions of sea life will perish. We depend on that sea life quite a bit, even if it's radiated at this point in our lives. Um, verse 10, and a third angel sounded and they felt a great star from heaven, fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and fell upon a third of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Verse 11, the name of the star was called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood and many men died in the waters because they were bitter. Now some theologians try and stretch it that to being an angel because the star is often referenced to an angel, but again, I will have to take the stance that it is more than likely a meteor. NASA has discovered that uh, meteors and comets uh, look like torches falling from the sky, which we've all seen plenty of uh, comets in our lifetime. But the cyanogens uh, gas that is around the comet is hydrogen cyanide. Hitting the water will give off an almond odor. The water becomes bitter. In less than five parts per million, it's deadly. Science supports scripture here. Now, the other thing you need to know is the Greek word for wormwood is absent. The correlation, again, is that sweet smell. Most, if you are familiar with that particular substance that uh, is consumed today, to this day, absinthe does have a very sweet smell. It doesn't particularly taste like almonds, uh, but that is the herb or plant wormwood. There's also many other uh, uh, herbs that are referenced in the Bible that uh, have the same connotation. Now. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten with the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars, so the third part of them were darkened. You can see a lot of thirds here. So there's not much light. It's going to be pretty dark. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Now, on a very small scale, you're going to see the effects of darkness on Alaska. Okay, I'm going to use it as a reference because that's all we have. Uh, in some, it causes hibernation. Literally, people just don't even bother getting out of bed during those times uh, in the winter. Uh, in many cases, it causes depression. Vitamin D supplementation, supplementation becomes essential. 
Um, they have created a disorder in Alaska um, during the winter called SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder. And of course, it becomes much colder without the warmth of the sun. Now that's just one isolated place on the earth. So if a third of the sun is completely darkened, that means a third of the earth is completely darkened. We would imagine some serious dangers, uh, depraved minds becoming catastrophically evil and criminal. Now, this is interesting. Imagine a dark world. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. That's John 1, verse 5. We're going to be hard to miss. When things are going to get really wacky on this planet, people are going to do horrible things. Christians are going to stand out like sore thumbs. We're going to be glowing. The light of Christ is going to shine like never before. And if you're holding fast and you're enduring, the people that need you are going to be clinging to you. We're going to continue to minister. We're going to continue to share the gospel. Verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth for the reason of the voice of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. Angels. Some of the angels like to do things in triplicate, one of which was in Isaiah 6, and he did it for the honor and glory of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In this case, he's letting you know there's some really bad stuff coming. You'd think that the, the comet and the meteor were pretty bad. Verse Chapter 9, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from the heaven unto earth, and in him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Here's the reference of star where it can be used as an angel. And he opened up the bottomless pit, and arose smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of the great furnace, and the sun of the air were darkened by the reason of smoke pit, smoke of the pit. And there came out of its smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them were given power, and the scorpions of the earth have power. And again, they... they a lot of theologians have this allegorical sense of this. They even try and stretch the uh, locusts into being choppers and so on and so forth. I believe these are genuinely demons. I believe this is an invasion of demons upon the earth. Something out of a Clive Barker novel, if you're familiar with that particular writer. Demons are not something to be trifled with if you're without the spirit. In Acts 19, Paul was baptizing... We're going to be going there in just a second. So in Acts 19, Paul was baptizing on the coast of Ephesus. He had laid hands upon and healed evil. And uh, the, the evil left those who were inflicted. So we're going to go to 19 real quick. And a certain, and then the certain of the vagabonds in verse th uh, 13 to Jews, exorcists took upon them a call over them which had evil spirits. And they came to the Lord Jesus and they the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And so basically they're saying, We're exercising you in the name of Jesus Christ, the, 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 the God that Paul preaches about. So like third and fourth party. Well, are we understanding? Are we on the same page with this? He's, it's 19 verse 13, Walter. So he's, he's trying to exercise a demon. Well, my, 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 my friend Paul here knows this, this God named Jesus Christ, and we're going to exercise in his name. Not a pretty thing. Verse 14, there were seven sons of, uh, of one, Sibia, a Jew, if I'm pronouncing it right, Sibia, Sibia, a uh, chief of the priests, which had did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know, but who are you? Demons aren't to be messed with. And the man in whom the evil spirit leapt on him and overcame him and the prevailed against him so that the, they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now, something else I need to point out if you haven't noticed throughout scripture, demons don't have a body. Demons are spirit. They have to embody something. They inhabit. Fallen angels, on the other hand, can manifest themselves. Very interesting thing I just learned. And it's kind of interesting because both of them occupy the same dark place. 
I'm going to give you another example of how treacherous these, these demons are. Mark 5. Now I'm sharing this with you because I want you to pray for those who are lost. I want you to minister to those who are either ignoring Christ or don't know him. Verse 1, And they came unto them the other side of the sea, unto the country of Gedarines, and when they had come out of the ship, immediately they met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, not it, no, not with chains. So here's a man who's, who's become superhuman strength as a result of the demon that embodied him, breaking chains. Because he had been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day they had mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. So not only was he, which is actually a very common thing, I would just say in case you didn't know, in the demonic world, when somebody's possessed, cutting is common. It's a very uh, normal practice for demons to do that. They afflict the flesh. Then um, when they saw Jesus after, afar uh, off, they ran and worshipped him. And cried a loud voice, said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, thou that torment me not. For he said unto them, Come, out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country, now there were nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter them. The demons need something to embody. They, they, I don't know what it is about the, this situation with the demons, because I don't, I don't have an answer, but they have to be in something. Otherwise, they'll probably be in that pit of smoke, fire. But the other thing I want you to notice is unlike people... The demons knew exactly who Jesus Christ was. Pharaohs would stand before him, deny him, mock him. I do believe that they knew. Demons knew who Christ was. Demons still know who Christ is. But again, it's, you need to be mindful. There's so many people in this world that are really in trouble. Demons are not to be trifled with. This is no joke, and, and apparently, possessions on a rise. I've been reading all kinds of stuff about people getting possessed all, all around the world. There was this woman getting interviewed, and in the middle of the interview, she got inhabited. Demon took over her body. Now yeah, I'm sure that some of this stuff is fake. But there's so much of it, the Vatican actually put out a, a message that they just don't have enough people to handle. The invasion of demons upon the earth is something, again, out of a Clive Barker film. Um, this should not frighten my kin. By the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, we have the same authorities. We stand not alone. In the name of Christ, we are free from that woe, but there are many who are not. Turn with me to John 15. Some of you know where I'm going. John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Does that make sense? We all understand that particular scripture. We're a part of Christ. And the evidence is the fruits that we bear. Verse 6. If a man abideth not in me, and he is cast forth as a branch and would wither, and men gather them and cast them into the fire that they are burning. Okay? 
Some people, some who profess Christ, go to church. They may even do great works, be homeless, keep clean lives, but they never were reborn. This is happening all across the world, not just in one particular location. There are people that inhabit churches every Sunday or Saturday or Wednesday or whatever day that they're going to fellowship and they're not saved. There are a great many who are lied to. They were told that if they say this prayer, they'll have eternal life. It's a lie. It is not the act of the prayer. It's the will and work of the Holy Spirit in you. The pastor was talking about this fellow that was unsaved. And he had turned to John 3.16 and started to weep. It says here... I have eternal life just if I believe in Jesus. Yes, it's true. But now show the fruits. The Holy Spirit indwells in you. It's not the words that you've spoken. It's the Holy Spirit doing the work. There are some that will suffer greatly from tribulation, many of whom will cry, where is Jesus? As a matter of fact, I read an article about a host of uh, bishops saying that Christ isn't returning. They've come to the conclusion that things are so bad that he's not going to come back. The Bible says otherwise. Read it. Verse, tw verse 12, chapter 9, verse 12, back into Revelations, please. I skip a page? Yes, yeah, 66, where is it? I'm missing page 66. And the funny thing, they come out of the printer all at the same time and in order, and then somehow they don't get it in order. They go right from the printer, there it is. Okay. 66, All right, the first row, the fifth trumpet, demons are unleashed, okay? We're gonna go to verse four of chapter nine, excuse me. And it was commanded them that should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God on their foreheads. What does that mean? He's a okay. to still be here. First of all, we have demons that are told they can't hurt anything except for those men which have not the seal of God. Okay, if there are all those are the only men on the earth. They shouldn't have to be instructed. It would be easy. The church will be there. We're going to witness demons unleashed upon this earth. The church will be there and our sovereign God has spoken that these monsters cannot hurt us. Verse 5. And them that was given that that should not kill them, but they should not be tormented five months. They should, excuse me, should be tormented five months. And the torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. If you haven't been stung by a scorpion, sometimes it's really bad for some, and sometimes it's more like a bee sting. But here's the fascinating thing. Some people have this connotation about time, and this could be 150 days, just like they were making reference to um, Noah. I don't know how they made that correspondence. But what I did find interesting is they, the locusts themselves, when they live five months, there's a specific season, May through September. I don't know if that particularly means something, 
but it's if he's using the reference of locust, it might be important. And especially if they reiterate the fact that it's five months. Some believe, again, it's a 150-year period. Uh, some certain uh, that in that context. I'm not certain of that context because of Matthew 24, 2, where it says, for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. I can't imagine going 150 years having to contend with all these demons around me. It would just get tiresome. You know? It just, I would get, like, you know, Really? Verse 6, In those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall not flee from them. I believe this is literal. It's not figurative. I don't, I don't think that there's any kind of hint or, or eluding of something here. I believe that there will be a great many people on this earth that are going to want to die. If they're inhabited by demons and they're cutting themselves, or the demons are just tormenting them, stinging them here, stinging them there, they're going to say, you know what, just kill me. Or they're going to try to die, and they can't. What an unusual thing to consider. Again, we have to realize this is the wrath of God. You want to escape your punishment? I don't think he's going to let you. We will evangelize them. I really strong, feel strongly about this. I think we're going to continue to minister during this time. I hope so. I really do. There may be some of these people that are tormented souls and they need just that type of fire to turn them. Some people need to literally be burned. I know some people in my own life that need to have something that catastrophic to turn them. You know, it's funny. I seem to remember reading somewhere that somebody was possessed and came to Christ afterwards. I'm trying to remember who that was. It was recently, within the last 10, 10 years, that somebody had actually become possessed. They were a non-believer, obviously, because you cannot be possessed if you are a believer. I don't think that's possible. I don't think if you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that that's, that's a, a reality. It just can't happen. So, as a result of possession, they then gave their lives to Christ. It took the act of a demon embodying them. So it's very possible that we might end up seeing that after this fifth trumpet. Verse 7. And the shapes of these locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Again, if you've seen the, the locusts in the Middle East, they look like horses. And on their heads were as, were as it were crowns like gold. Not of gold, but similar to. Uh, and their faces were as, as the faces of men. Again, not really faces of men, but similar to. They had hair of a woman, and their teeth were teeth of lions. And they had breastplates that were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots, and many horses running into battle. And they had tails like unto the scorpions, which they talked about stinging in prior verses, uh, that were stingers in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Again, they tried to make it an allegorical thing. It might be choppers sending shooting at people. There's all kinds of theories, but I really feel strongly that these are genuinely just demons. If we have unusual, four unusual angels in the beginning of this book, God said these are angels. They're up by the throne. Wings and one's got a face of a man. Got an eagle up there. There's all kinds of unusual creatures in heaven. Why wouldn't there be unusual creatures in the pit? The demons have a very unusual description. The pulpit commentary actually alludes to them uh, to being Muhammad and Sarak scenes. Um, some uh, will believe that uh, these uh, would be demons inhabiting the barbaric men of. of uh, these Muslim ISIS, Islamic. So there's 
theories and ideas regarding that. Maybe, I don't know, I don't have an answer, but I can tell you for sure that in my personal opinion that these are just genuinely demons. Um, will they be inhabiting, um, demons inhabiting those uh, men? They probably are. I don't think that uh, those men are, are acting out of, uh, out of human nature. I think that those are very much likely animals, the demons. It's very possible that they're possessed. Verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is, in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Ap Apollyon. Now, you got to remember back in Proverbs it says that the locusts don't have a king. This is actually the devil. Uh, about Abaddon and Apollyon, the names for Satan, the destructor. Incidentally, I have just realized uh, in this message that that's verse, chapter 9, verse 11. It's an interesting coincidence. I don't know if that had got to any of you. Abaddon, Apollon means the destructor. And that's found in chapter 9, verse 11. It's a coincidence. I don't know if it means anything, but it's a coincidence. John 10:10. 10, 10. Read this real quick. John 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not by for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I come, they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Again, being the light in the darkness, we'll be ministering to those who have not taken the name of Jesus Christ. That's what they're referring to back, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, verse 4. And it is commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any, but only those men which have not the seal of God. The seal of God is his name. If you are, in fact, the bride, you bear the groom's name. Verse 12. And that's so important to know. If you're running around saying things that are not godly, doing things that are not godly, celebrating things that are not godly. You're an, you're, you, you're an ambassador of Christ. Just act like it. Verse 12, And one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Verse 13, And the six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Now the four horns, they believe, are the synoptic gospel. Again, I don't know. Possible. Could be that. That could be what is meant by that. Now, verse 14. Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are abound in the great river Euphrates. Verse 15. And the four angels were loosed. And they were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Now, another little interesting I've come across is that fallen angels are territorial. For some reason, they're bound to Euphrates. I don't know why. But they're territorial. They tend to be. For, throughout Scripture, they tend to be territorial. There's people that have done studies on this stuff. But these fallen angels are given a command. To slay one third of the men. That's 1.3 billion people if we're using this, the numbers that we have now. So you'll see the numbers start shrinking. Huh? Well, it's an approximation. You see the numbers start shrinking because if we've started with just over 7 billion, right, on the planet, and we've had a third taken away already, now we've got another third. So it, it's, it's starting to to shrink the population. So we've got just over 5 billion left on the planet. So 
given the right to go and kill them. Verse 16, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200 to 200,000 thousands. So it's 200 million, is that about right? Um, and I heard the number of them. Verse 17, I saw the horses in the vision of them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and chastened and brimstone. And on their heads of the horses were heads of the lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And the three were third part of the men killed by the fire, the smoke and the brimstone, and out of the brimstone which were issued out of their mouths. And so they were the four, uh, four angels that were loosed were told to slay them. And then, as you see, they brought forth an army with them to do the slaying. Or it could mean that the four had already slain a third and now you have another army that's slaying another third. Could be sequential. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were likened unto serpents and their heads were them that they do hurt. More unusual images. Again, some people try and make them war machines. I don't know. I think they are genuinely demons. I'm going to have to stick with that. The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not for their works of their hands. They, had, they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Verse 20, neither repent they their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their fornication, their thefts. So we have half the Earth's population dead. From meteors, asteroids, disasters, followed by demons and armies of demons, and fallen angels, and still the heathens of this Earth love their sins so much they continue to murder. Now, sorceries in here is pharmacia. Okay, it's not sorceries like, you know, your not a cauldron, a little eye of newt and frog, whatever. They're talking about drugs. We have a, a drug. It's not even a culture anymore. Drugs are part of everybody's life. Whether you're, you're, you're taking them just to survive because you, you have ailments or you're recreationally using them. When I think here we're talking about people that party. Fornication which encompasses all sexual acts and thoughts outside of the covenant of marriage. Most people don't get that. And, and, and my, some of my dearest and closest friends that's one of their favorite things. Well, I'm going to reiterate what exactly fornication means. It encompasses all sexual acts and thoughts outside of the covenant of marriage. Period. And finally, we have theft. Massive riots on a global scale that will be filled with the remnants of those disgusting of the human race, men and women who have become enamored with their own wretchedness, completely and utterly depraved with no hope of retribution, they are those who could clearly be defined as walking dead, simply playing out their final days before the eternal damnation. For our own sakes, this is why we evangelize. This is the purpose for soul winning for Christ. The sooner they come to Christ, isn't really for his sake in one respect, but it's for those of us who know, and certainly those who are not yet saved. It is, however, for his glory. All of it. So once again, although not specifically addressed as the bride, the church, elect, chosen, saved, those who believe, are alluded to. We will see horrors and must comfort one another. And I'm going to repeat Thessalonians again. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, final trumpet, 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words you're not comforting one another if you're telling somebody that they're going to be raptured before all this happens you're giving them false hope comfort one another all who are the house of faith and remain we will need each other greater than we've ever known the free world will suffer greatly as they really have not been prepared they have no idea what's to come. They all think they're going to get raptured up. They believe the lies. The scripture doesn't lie. Yes, there's a lot of things in here that we don't understand. But if Christ says he's going to come for us at the end, not before the end, not in the middle of the end, Telling us to hold fast, how many times? Hold fast, hold fast, endure to the end, overcome. Father, your wisdom, your mercy that you give us. Your grace that we don't deserve. All our days can be spent in service to you for all eternity. It could never be good enough. But you give it to us anyway. You give all of this to us. Joint heirs with the most holiest our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ how could this be again we are immensely grateful and we pray that we serve you well and we bear your name righteously and we say these things in your son's name Jesus Christ Amen. Thank you.